Today, it's going to be myself, Susan McCallion, with McCallion and McCallion Real Estate here on Sanibel and Captiva Islands. Along with me is Linda Coyne. She's a friend of mine um, and has been here on our islands for many years now. Um, she and her husband, Dana, own a company called Decorating Den. And I'm going to ask Linda to talk a little bit about Decorating Den uh, before we get started. Well, thanks for putting that nice picture up of us. Um, Decorating Den Interiors is a full service interior design company. Uh, we offer virtually anything within the four walls of a home. Uh, we make the selection process, the whole process very easy. Certainly what drives our business is absentee owners and they need someone to be able to be their eyes and ears while they're here. So we kind of kind of fill those shoes. Um, but our goal is to do our design work within the home. We bring samples in and uh, actually do our complete work right there with the clients um, in terms of making selections, making final selections. Now for clients that are not here, um, we do offer virtual. Uh, we were doing virtual design presentations even ahead of the current circumstances. So we have really got that down and people can really get a sense of what the, the end result of their project will be. So um, it's kind of got, been a really fun opportunity over the last several years. We've got five additional designers that have joined us and we have a super team. And um, yeah, yeah, certainly if anybody needs any design assistance at all, we're, we're um, willing and able. And Linda, you've been doing this for years. How long have you been doing this? I've been doing design work um, uh -huh. for, over t for over 20 years. Dana and I purchased this existing decorating den uh, business uh, over five years ago, about five and a half years ago. Our corporate company, our main company, uh, Decorating Den Interiors, is the oldest uh, and largest interior design company in all of North America. And our location has been here on Sanibel for 30 years. Wow, I didn't realize that. Um, I have to say that Linda um, sold one of her homes here on the island about seven or eight years ago. And I was blown away with how she transformed the home from when she purchased it to when she sold it. It was an amazing transformation. And I've had the wonderful opportunity to see many other homes transformed in the same way. So excellent job to you, Linda. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so let me, why stage? Um, you know, whenever you think that you might be selling somewhere down the road, whether it be in two weeks, two months, or two years, um, it's always good to try to understand how someone else might see your home when they walk through the door. Um, so often, I realize in my own home that um, I didn't know there was a chip in that paint, or I didn't know that. Um, that I forgot to get the edge of a particular area with, with paint or uh, that things don't look just right because I'm so used to living in my home. So when you think that you're going to sell your home, um, you want to start thinking like a buyer thinks, like it's your first time in the home ever. Um, and when you're a buyer of a home, you tend to, I at least see buyers tend to lean towards homes that are staged because they're inviting, because people can envision how life would be for them in this home. Um, they don't have personal photos necessarily. They, um, they're welcoming, they're spacious. Um, so when I think of why staging, I think that it helps you sell your home faster and for more money. Um, and I have to say that if I were going to sell my home today, I would stage it for sure. Um, I would probably 
remove a lot of what I have and um, get it ready for the market and have it look quite different than it looks now that I'm living in it. And I am confident that um, any money that I invest in little accoutrements or little accent pieces would be um, well invested and back in my pocket when I sell. Do you want to add anything to that, Linda? Well, you know, what I always tell our clients is when we're, we're talking about staging, I get this question a lot, you know, should we change, should we change things? What should we change if we're going to put our house on the market? Um, you know, people are often a little bit hesitant because they quite honestly don't want to move forward with additional expenditures in a home that they are not going to be living in. But the number one goal is that you want to establish a uh, an emotional response when that buyer walks in the home. Um, I know probably many of us can say that when we walk in any type of uh, home, whether it's a friend, a relative, a coworker, um, you know, there's that, that initial first impression is really, really important. So, um, you know, I, I always tell folks the same thing with model homes is you're looking to develop some type of an, a positive emotional response upon walking in that home to say, hmm, I really could see myself here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first impressions are huge. And, um, you know, when I show homes, um, I immediately still am um, subject to someone's first impression. So when I, and I walk in homes all the time, but if I walk into a home that has clear counters, that's bright, light, airy, um, no clutter around, I immediately like it more. And I do it all the time. I should be able to see through all that. So um, what are some of your thoughts that you might want to add to getting yourself on track for being on the market and staging regarding cluttering cluttering storage like how do you get rid of stuff well storage is a great um a great solution for clutter however um it's interesting there's there's a phenomenon in terms of clutter people uh translate cut, clutter um, in terms of somehow regulating the level of cleanliness within a home. If they see clutter, they feel that the home is not as clean. And you know, all of the clutter could be beautifully dusted and, and presented, but that's just how it translates to um, the typical individual. So in terms of um, decluttering, that's, a, that's always been our number one um, you know, the, the first thing that you should dive into in terms of the process, uh, there's a lot, certainly a lot of um, uh, charities that are very, very uh, happy to accept donations. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do. A lot of times children, uh, it's time to start kind of dispersing personal things and there's children or other relatives that are be happy to have those items as well. But, uh, the, and the other thing is in terms of storage, everyone's always looking for more storage and um, we offer a, a storage system, um, you know, some custom closets and everyone here, especially because those from the North, because they, uh, and, and this I'm, I'm sure uh, Susan would relate back to buyers, there's no basements here. So everyone from Northern areas are coming and looking for that storage that they've had in other homes. Um, if things are cluttered and full, then it just doesn't translate that there's enough storage. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, uh, something I mentioned to all of my sellers is, you know, if you're getting ready to sell and you um, are intent on moving to another place, start now. Start boxing up things that you're not going to use within the next six months and put them in a storage um, rented storage area or put them in one of the pods or something like that um, and get them ready to move to your next home if you don't need them right away. Because I think um, quite often if people see, I've seen closets beautifully um, packed 
with lots of things and very organized, but really, really full. Um, and I always get comments. I hear comments when people look at those closets. Oh, wow, they have really, you know, they pack things really well, but I know what the buyer is really saying is, I'm not sure I'm gonna have enough space here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any thoughts on bathrooms when it comes to this? Well, definitely things on the, on the vanities need to be removed. Um, this also translates not just to closets, but spaces in general, if they are clean and they are, you're not distracted by those items that are sitting upon countertops, both kitchen baths, the kitchen and baths look larger. So it's, it's letting the eye go beyond, you know, if you walk in and you have a lot of tchotchkes or um, toiletries and, and so on on the, on the bathroom counter, your eye stops right there. It doesn't go beyond to look at anything else. Same goes um, for things like within a shower area. You want to make sure that those are always put away and cleaned up. I think times, you know, the homes that I'm in, a lot of times people just get, as you said, you get comfortable and you don't see things that other people might see. Mm -hmm. So if you're used to walking in your bathroom every day and seeing all these things lined up uh, on your, on your uh, vanity top, um, you know, you're, you're not seeing it every day, but a buyer certainly will. So a quick question for you, Linda. We do have a couple folks on this call today that are new homeowners. What if they want to continue to have that beautifully staged look as they start their life here? Do you have special products that they can um, investigate that help minimize clutter on countertops in bathrooms so they can be more efficient with their storage on a daily basis? Well, one thing that we do um, for, for, in, for instance, setting up a model home, we can have things that are very beautiful, accessories that add color or character to the space that can actually have hidden storage. So there's two ways of doing that. If they're looking to add some beautiful things to their home, there's a way, you know, there's a way for us to do that. And we oftentimes do look for accessories that offer additional storage. This can be baskets and box, decorative boxes or vases and, and um, you know, there's, there's just a, a whole lot of things that are available. Decorative shelving. Um, however, we do have the custom closet systems and we use those everywhere, not just in closets. Hmm. They can be installed in, you know, we do it in, certainly in a study. That's another area that can tend to be a catch-all area. Uh, we can do studies, we can do laundry areas, mud rooms are another real popular option. So um, really just about anything, and this is at varying pri price points too. Um, this particular product that I'm speaking of, it is custom made, but it's at a really favorable price point. Now, if something, uh, we do have a custom cabinetry line where we can can bring things up and you know it certainly depends on the level the price point of the home and the level of quality that that the client's looking for mm -hmm. great thank you decorate in odd numbers linda this is your <laughs> okay the reason that we say this this is interesting so um and and people sometimes will when i when i talk about things like this they go oh i know i never really thought of this so if you look at things and you prefer symmetry, you would tend to be more traditional in your, um, in your preferences for furnishings, for decor items. If you tend to like things that are asymmetrical, typically you would be more interested in modern or contemporary design. So that's kind of the basis of this. However, we tend to decorate in odd numbers when we're trying to attract the eye. Symmetry, we tend to just slide over. Asymmetry, the three, five, seven is an example. It catches our eye. So just to kind of put this in context of what we're talking about today, let's say especially in our area, not everyone has a fireplace. A fireplace is really, is really a, a wonderful upgrade that a home would have. We want, we want the buyer to just zone in on that right when they walk in. Well, we'll create a odd number, a display 
um, kind of highlighting that asymmetry or the odd number display and it draws your eye right to it. So it's one of those things, you know, a lot of, a lot of things that we talk about in interior design and decorating, it's kind of how our human brains are wired. There's things that are pleasing to us and things that cause us to notice things. Um, this is, you know, another thing when I talk about taking that common thread through a home and establishing flow, that makes, you know, if you walk in a model home, that's what makes it, makes it appealing. Um, we don't know why, but we say, wow, this really looks wonderful. It's just the way our brain is wired. We'd like to see that consistency. So that's, that's what's behind this tip, is actually to draw your eye to a highlight of that particular property. So um, when you talk about a thread that carries through the property, are you talking about the paint on the wall or is it something a little more subtle than that? It can be the paint on the wall. It can be the um, upholstery items, the uh, draperies within. Anything that adds texture or color through that home. Um, an example I use, I, I usually start with a uh, a color palette. So it does, when I say we're gonna establish flow, initially our clients, my new clients, will think that I'm suggesting to have the same color palette through the whole house. That's not exactly so, but I'll give you an example. So let's say we're going to suggest a navy, a gray, and a coral color palette through the house. What we want to do is have one of those three colors that is present in our main living area, the public area, translate into the other areas of that home. So what is going to be our common thread? Is it going to be our gray? Is it going to be our navy? Or is it going to be the coral? Let me just use the coral as an example. If we take the coral through the rest, through into a guest room, maybe we go ahead and we add that bit of turquoise with the coral there. And in the next room, we'll take the coral and we maybe we do the coral, or make it a taupe room with an accent of coral. So we're not taking that gray, navy, and coral literally through the whole house as it's as a grouping, but we're separating it and creating that thread that will go through the whole home. Does that make sense? That's amazing. <laughs> You're so smart. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. Um, since you brought up paint colors, what do you think about paint? What type of paint is the uh, sponging coming back? Is uh, what are the colors that we should be looking at? Yeah, we really haven't gotten back into too much of the decorative type of processes anymore. Um, you know, there's been some some suggestion with graphic paints in lieu of a wall covering. You know, an example would be maybe like a bold stripe, things like that. Um, that can be done and add some interest and it's kind of a cost effective way to do it. In terms of staging a home, I think that a neutral palette is always best. Um, reason being also, I tend to find with my clients when they ha are, have purchased a home here, um, they are not coming from outside the islands or outside of Southwest Florida, they're not necessarily accustomed to the bright colors on the walls that we are very accustomed to seeing here. And I tend to have to kind of ease them into that. So my suggestion in terms of staging is that you would want to be careful about using too vivid of a color because it's just something new to a potential buyer. Uh, in my experience with our with our um, design clients. So let's say for an example, you know, a bright lime green in your living room, once you've lived on the island for a while, that seems kind of fun. But for someone who is just new to the to our type of more vivid, you know, colorful decor, that can kind of be off putting. Do you think I see a lot of grays um our gray is coming in are they here to stay are they going out this is this is a constant um conversation so gray when it was first developed and you know and kind of be coming back because we all saw it in the 80s right so now and, and it, then it came back and um 
it was probably about five or six years ago. And no one was interested in gray hair at that point in time. And all the manufacturers and all our reps kept showing us gray and gray and gray. And at some point I said, we, it, gray is not translating here. And then eventually it hit. So I would say we were a little late to the party, which is kind of funny because gray really translates well for a coastal uh, environment. And it translates really well for, um, you know, in terms of adding some of those brighter colors. So, and, and, and of course, driftwood, you know, so a lot of times that's, that's one thing I started to do is I started to connect uh, things that would be um, found on our island and suggesting, well, what if we do like the color of driftwood? And people started to kind of warm up to it. So then, you know, everybody all of a sudden wanted gray. So then about two years ago, the, the manufacturers who, you know, they feel like they run the show, right? All of our high point market and, you know, everything new that comes out every year. They said, gray is going by the wayside. And I said, gray is not going by the wayside here. People still love it. But what we're seeing is that gray is going more, what we're calling a French gray, where it has a kind of a topish, almost brown type of undertone to it. So it's a warmer gray than what we were seeing. I don't think that the general public is ready to let go of gray, even though all the manufacturers are saying it's done. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? That so, the, so, so who drives the market? Yeah, hmm. I don't know about that. Um, I'm gonna keep on doing gray, I like gray. <laughs> um, okay, so neutral colors, depersonalizing. Um, I see this a lot. You wanna make sure that um, you may have a million and a half wonderful memories, um, but you've gotta gently, lovingly put those away because when someone walks in your house to view it, you want them to focus on the bones of your house. You don't want them to look at your artwork. You don't want them to look at your um, family photos from Abby when she was three and Caitlin when she was 12. Um, so that's usually important. You also wanna make sure that, um, you know, you, you may have a strong political or religious um, belief you you don't want too much of any one thing in your house um you know so be careful about that um i did show a home recently that uh the owners had a very strong political belief and it really turned off buyers and it was a two million dollar home um so you want to be careful about that you can have your strong beliefs but um, your beliefs will go with you. They won't go with the house. Um, and minimizing eclectic artwork. Um, you know, I think that Linda probably has a good idea of artwork that is um, pleasing to a lot of people. What would you, how would you categorize that? How would you know if something's eclectic? Because that's somewhat subjective. Artwork is very subjective. Even in making selections of artwork for our clients, that's really the one thing that I really have to sit down and really dig in, into with them if, if they want me to be a part of that. Um, you know, art means something different to all people. But one thing that, that you know, certainly there's, everyone likes landscapes. And, and that just seems to be something that's, that's pretty general. Um, when we start to get into realism or abstract, then it starts to get a little more polarizing, but I find that most people do warm up to abstracts. I mean, excuse me, to landscapes very, very easily. But one other thing I can add to your comments, Susan, is uh, we with Decorating Den, we have a dream room program, uh, which is where we photograph rooms and they're um, displayed in national magazines. So um, Good Housekeeping, El Decor, Architectural D Digest. So I, I think that this point can be taken um, because those are appealing to the general public. We cannot submit an image 
that has any um, type of religious symbol, that has any type of um, a family image or a, a, a image of a person in it. Um, sometimes even if we are displaying something on a, maybe an office or a desk, we actually kind of put some um, little scenic um, type of uh, photographs in the frames on the desk so that we're not highlight, highlighting an individual person. So, and I think it's all part of that depersonalizing so that that advertisement that's in that national magazine is appealing. So that's maybe something to take into consideration as well in terms of, you know, removing your, your personal items. Yeah, that's, that's great. Very helpful to hear. Um, asymmetrical groupings are more interesting than symmetrical. We talked about that a little bit. And, yeah. um, I was surprised to hear that because I love symmetry and I, you know, I like three by threes or four by fours and uh -huh. I like things to be balanced, but you don't think that that, that is not what catches someone's eye or maybe makes someone feel at home. It makes people that, well, like I said, if it's a traditional design, someone that is more attracted to traditional design, they tend to like things that are symmetrical. Symmetrical makes you feel comfortable, but it doesn't draw your eye. Okay. So it gives you a feel of comfortable, you know, com of comfort when you see it, but it's not going to highlight that, you know, particular thing that you're looking at. Can you give us an example of the most asymmetrical design project you did? <laughs> most asymmetrical. Uh, well, certainly with art, you know, we do some of the displays, you know, we can display art very creatively to kind of make a little bit of drama in that regard. Um, ace, asymmetry. Sometimes it's also, oh, with bookcases, we do a lot of asymmetry in book, with bookcases because if, imagine if you have a bookcase and you have everything lined up symmetrical, it wouldn't be very interesting to look at or very pleasing. Yeah. Um, so we do do that often. Sometimes even as asymmetrical um, vignette would be, uh, let's say at an entry area, we've got a chair and we've got a table and we've got a lamp and we've got, you know, something beside the chair. So nothing symmetrical is in there, in there, but yet it's giving it kind of that um, level of interest. So it still sounds like it's balanced. And I think that's, something good to it's, know. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's balanced it's in a different way. Yeah. Balanced. yeah, they both offer their version of balance. I will agree with that. Yeah, all right, wonderful, thank you. Um, furniture arrangement, can you talk a little bit about that? Furniture arrangement's always very important. Um, however, you know, at the beginning of, of the presentation, when you talked about living in your home is different than selling your home or selling your home is different than living in your home, um, Reason being, the way that we all live in our homes is really for comfort, um, how it works for us. It may not be the best way to highlight that room. So in dealing with our clients, you know, even aside from, from a staging a, a, a home, um, perhaps I go on to talk to a new client about making some changes in their home and well, that's just the way the sofa's always been. And those chairs have always been there. But you know, maybe they're blocking off an area. Maybe they're making the room look smaller. There's just things that people, when they live with it, they just don't see anymore. But uh, it, I, the goal with the staging a home is to maximize the, uh, not only the space, the appearance of space, but the functionality of the space. So furniture arrangements, very, very important. Also, one thing I see on a regular basis, and I don't know, what it is with people, but this is just the way it is. <laughs> Everybody seems to like to have those chairs right in front of the TV. And uh, that's not always the, you know, there are other options that we can present for TV viewing for, for entertainment purposes within a room. Um, however, they are comfortable living in it that way and being able to sit in front of the TV and watch your favorite favorite show, but it may not show the functionality or the space that's available within that particular residence. I am so glad you brought that up 
because I think so many people when they come to Sanibel, it's a place that they have vacationed here with family members in the past. So they're coming with great memories of family time, of game playing, of conversations, of those interactions. I doubt they remember any TV shows or movies they watched with their family while they were here. Yeah. And when they look at homes, um, I, I often notice that really well-staged homes may sometimes not even have a TV in the living room because it's all focused on, on communication and being with, with other people in a sitting arrangement. So it's interesting that you mentioned that I uh, hadn't thought of it that way before. Mm -hmm. But having chairs looking at the TV is not a good thing. Furniture arrangement also comes into play to highlight really, you know, let's say for instance, there's a house that has an interesting floor plan, might not be the best floor plan for the majority of the general public. Well, one thing that we're, we're seeing a lot of right now, obviously, I think we're all aware of this, is the request for home offices. So if we can expand of maybe, maybe a house that has an extra, you know, extra rooms and it just doesn't seem to really flow well, if we can show a purpose to these rooms, um, be it a workout room, be it a craft room, uh, an office, um, a, a grandchildren's room. I mean, you, you name it, we've, we've done it all. Um, but it's really to put a purpose with these spaces, I think increases the, um, the acceptance of some of the floor plans that are a little bit unique. Um, you know, maybe it just doesn't make sense to somebody when they walk through. But if, if you can say, oh, this is a TV watching room or this is a craft room, it suddenly, it makes, it makes sense of those spaces. When I say those wonky spaces. Yeah, that's a good point. I remember one house I uh, was in had a gift wrapping room. Oh, that's fun. And it was fully equipped with papers and pens for writing envelopes and letters and the table with the special cutters and yeah. thing was for gift wrapping. It was yeah. Scary. We've had some clients that have had those scrapbooking rooms. They're really into that and it's kind of, you know, dedicated. A lot of gentlemen too have hobbies and have, we've had rooms that were dedicated to their hobbies as well. So um, yeah, it's just, just depends. You know, sometimes there's just an empty space in a room or an odd corner that just seems like it's unaddressed and it's kind of nice to show that there's a purpose for that little area. Mm -hmm. Sometimes lofts have that as well. People don't really know what to do with them and we can show them how to make that an asset to the home rather than a detriment. Mm -hmm. Those little nooks and crannies. Great, great feedback. Um, do you wanna go over the tip? Well, grouping should be attractive from the point of view of which they are seen. So one thing, and, and, and I have to say that I think that on occasion, I do this. I'll place something within a design. You know, the last thing that we do is we go in and accessorize. And I'll place it. And then as I'm working my way around the room, I get around to the other side. And I realize it's not as attractive by the time I've worked my way around the room. So if you are doing some staging, and really what accessories, the purpose of, of um, including accessories into your design is to add warmth to the space add warmth, add character. So if you're adding accessories, whether it's a home that you're looking to sell or a home that you're living in um, yourself, just make sure that it's attractive from all angles. People might be coming in through another hallway, they might be entering through the front door, they might be coming in through, you know, from the kitchen and you can see into the, the great room area. So once you place your accessories, make sure that you take that that walk, you know, kind of this circular path around and make sure that it's attractive from all angles. Also, you know, the other thing when we talk about groupings, this is not only towards accessories, but also um, I see this a lot with um, upholstered furniture, furniture pieces. 
you know, sometimes uh, furniture is placed in such a way that it really isn't attractive when you walk into another area of the room. You know, kind of my pet peeve is walking into a home and you walk into the back of chairs or sofa. So what are we gonna do to make that appealing and not just stop your eye? It's not that it can't be done, but we have to take extra thought to make sure that we turn it into a positive rather than a negative. Mm. Good point. Flooring. Um, yeah, you know, I think flooring is probably one of the most important things. Um, I'm not an interior designer, but when I look at a home, I think if you're going to update anything, flooring, lighting, those are probably at the top of my short, short list. What do you think? The expanse of flooring within a home is so huge that it needs to be addressed. You know, it's one of those things you think it's just the floor, but think about it in terms of square footage within a home. One of the la largest planes, you know, aside from walls within a home is the is flooring. So let's just use an example. If you have a color of not an attractive color of gold flooring throughout your home, that's just going to jump right out at somebody just because of the sheer amount of it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think sometimes we have to stand back and say, you know, we're just not thinking room to room. Think of the amount of, you know, uh, of attention that is placed to something like that, like flooring. Do you, do you have an opinion on flooring colors since you mentioned the gold? Um, do you think obviously neutral or do you try to go darker than your walls? Do you try to, is there any rule of thumb that you should go by? Well, I, I do happen to like neutral flooring myself. Um, however, oftentimes we do have clients that are looking to make a little more dramatic effect. So we go in a different direction. The one thing that I'll, I'll say is that the um, going with a dark flooring, if you are um, close to uh, an area that, you know, if you're close to the beach and you're gonna have sand coming in and out, we try to take all those kinds of things into consideration because sand really does show on a, on a dark floor. Um, there's just so many products available now too that uh, originally, you know, the, the vinyl prod products, the luxury vinyl tile, it was originally, LVT, now it's gone on and it's um, going by, uh, they've added plank rather than tiles, so it's LVP, Luxury Vinyl Plank. And most of you don't even realize that this is what we see in hotels and restaurants. Uh, it's a commercial, most of it is a commercial quality product and it's, it's very lovely. You know, we hear the word vinyl and we think of that sheet vinyl that we used to have, but that's been very well received. And, um, you know, I think we all, it, myself included, we all kind of turned our, nup, our nose up at it originally. Um, ceramic tile still seems to be very, very popular just because it's easy and virtually indestructible. And then um, engineered flooring. Um, we're not doing as much of the sand and finish wood flooring as we once did because the finishes on the engineered floors, those are factory finished and they really just hold up, you know, beautifully. So um, carpet, carpet uh, goes all over the place. You know, we've got high-end uh, Wilton weave type of wool carpets. Uh, wool carpet, even though we're in, in an environment, people are often surprised, like how does wool carpet work? In, well, we're, wool carpet is a natural fiber. It works beautifully in our environment and holds up for a very, very long time. So it's a wonderful, you know, high-end pro upscale um, product. But uh, we've got now not only carpet paddings, the underlayment, but the, um, uh, we have carpets that are specifically specified for people that have pets. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's and, and at all price points. So it's, it's really, the sky's the limit in terms of, of you know, options with flooring. Well, if someone is looking to um, change their flooring in order to sell their home um, and they want to use carpeting, is that 
a fine solution? And is that the most economical route to go? That is the most, rec typically the most economical route to go. I usually suggest um, staying away from plush carpets uh, just because they tend to, the wearability tends to be less than a loop carpet. So, um, but you know, we, we, have, we have one product that I really love a lot and I use it in a lot of rentals. Um, it's called Almost Sizal and it looks like Sizal, but it's actually a carpet material. Hmm. So you kind of get that fun beachy look, but um, the thing that our clients love about it the most is how affordable it is. So, um, I don't know, you know, those of you that are listening, I'm sure there's probably a few out there that are saying, oh yeah, I have that in my, uh, in my home or condo because um, I, tend to, I tend to use it a lot. I love it um, for the price point. But mm -hmm. I, I would say for, for an easy fix um, and a quick economic way to go would be carpet. Great, thank you. Usually doesn't require, you know, any type of uh, you know, all these other things that I talked about, they can um, require some treatment to the underlayment. So meaning the subfloor. And you'd be surprised the surprises that we find when we take up flooring. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, lighting. Do you have to install all new lights when you sell a house or when you want to uh, stage it? Well, the number one thing that I would suggest would be to just change, you know, very simple, change your light bulbs and increase the wattage. You know, we've all gone to lower wattage, lower light. Um, that's just kind of been the movement uh, within uh, the industry, uh, more for economics um, and energy efficiency. But in terms of selling a home, I think people are always respond you know, always attracted to things that are well lit and respond well to, to light. You know, when you think about it, why do we like homes with windows? Well, because they let the light in. Um, in terms of actually light fixtures, um, LED is of course very, very popular and it's the buzzword. And most people, when they're making changes, they're going into LED fixtures. Um, the pot lights, down lights, Recess lights, those have come a long way in their appearance. So it, the older, the older looking type of can light, um, I do have a lot of requests through our clients that one of the first things they'll say is, "I want these replaced when I go into, you know, into a home." Um, chandeliers for dining areas that can be a little bit subjective. Quite honestly, it's almost kind of like that art thing. Some people like to make more of a statement with a chandelier than, than others. So probably go, doing something relatively simple in that area um, would be advised. I will say, I have seen my share of um, chandeliers that are probably past their prime. So that's an, an, you know, an easy fix. It can really change the look of a room you know, quite easily. Just with a can of spray paint, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Sometimes it's even, you know, people will say, oh, I thought you were going to have me change my chandelier. I say, no, just let's take the shades off, you know, yeah. take the shades off of the, the candelabra segment and changes the look. So, you know, there's a, you know, always doesn't need to be changed, but I do see a lot of very unattractive chandeliers from probably 20, 30 years ago. It, yeah. it, it wouldn't break anybody's heart, I think, to see go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, key takeaways. Less is more, definitely. Bright and light, yeah, light and bright. Uh, and highlighting the view. I love that you get inspiration from our outside community and bring that into the home through colors and reflecting what you see outside. Sandoval is such a community focused on the nature and natural environment that we live in. So I love that that's part of what inspires you. Um, Linda is, as you can see, a wealth of knowledge and um, she could probably go on for days <laughs> sharing all of her, all of her 
good news and her wisdom, please do feel free to contact her. Her email is lynda at coindeckden.com and her phone number is 239-472-6551. Um, she does everything pretty much, right, Linda? Oh yeah, we absolutely do. Our are initial consultations are always complimentary. Um, and and uh, our process is, is really such that, you know, if, should, should we decide to work together, we put, put a plan together, present it to the client, and we virtually take care of the whole process for them. So we make really decorating very easy, but yet very personal, because every design is custom to that particular job. Yeah. And I should mention too, another, another thing that I think is really unique about us is we address the budget. So we say, I, I categorize all of our offerings for all our designers into good, better, and best categories. And that helps us to address the budget. So when all of our designers are trained to, when they're putting a design plan together, they work backwards off the budget. So when there's no surprises when we come back and and show um, a design plan, we show exactly, you know, where within that, that range that they feel that they would feel comfortable with. You know, do you do a lot of condos? Um, because we have so many condos on the island that yeah. um, have been lovingly lived in a little too long. Yeah. And um, I, I, wouldn't want to spend a lot of money to redo a condo, but certainly you need to invest something to make it um, enticing for people to come yeah. and visit. So how do you do that? Well, the condo, condo market is huge. It's huge for us as well. It's a different segment of our business. Um, you know, there's over 6,000 rental condos on our island. So, and I, and, and to your point, some have, um, you have our the uh, the furnishings are certainly past their prime or maybe they were there when the when the people uh the owners originally purchased it and it came with it and but i have found um updating it can be done affordably what we tend to do is we get our clients on a schedule so every three years this will need to be replaced every five years this will need to be replaced we go through that we typically do two, two sets of bedding so we don't have to recreate the wheel so there's already another set that's in storage or in the owner's closet for when the others become worn. Um, you know, we try to think ahead so that it's, it's an easy process to manage these types of things. We certainly go with performance fabrics. That's really important. Things that are going to hold up to sand and wet bathing suits and suntan oil. Suntan oil can be uh, really damaging to, um, to furniture. So we want to take that into consideration. Um, but we find that, and I, and I tell our clients this all the time, and they come back and say, you were so right. They get a little nervous about putting things in there. You know, it's all beautiful. Now it's going to be rented. Oh, and I say, you know what? When, the, when you, the condo is beautiful, people treat it better, mm -hmm. and they treat it with respect. And they've come back, and I've, I've, I had, I've had, you know, tens of hundreds, probably a hundred by now, that have come back to me and said, you are absolutely right. Once we upgraded everything and people really, really took good care of it. And then aside from that, certainly you have an opportunity to, to rent for just a little bit more to help compensate for the cost of the upgrades. Mm -hmm. I think people are willing, are willing to pay a little bit more for something that is really attractive to them when they when they come in. I will say though, one thing that's interesting to your point, I always kind of laugh at this too. People always ask about the TV. And they said that, um, you know, there were a lot of the rental companies, they, they want detailed information about how many televisions are in the space. And I always chuckle myself too. I think, well, you have that view. The beach is right there. What are you worried about? What are you worried about the TV for? But that seems to be an area that you know, people look for, you know, perspective um, renter tends to look for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, any questions? Feel free, anyone on the call, um, you will need to unmute your, your 
connection if you have questions. Um, in the meantime, if you're thinking about them, I'm going to ask you one last question, Linda, and that is what's your favorite design trend? Oh, goodness. Well, I have something I'm really excited about right now, and it's called biophilic design. So you all will be able to walk away not with a new term. So it's biophilic design. Now, that term historically has really related back to commercial buildings. So office buildings where they would add indoor gardens, trees, things like that. And then it was starting to translate into schools because we were finding that children were learning better in these environments that had brought the outside in rather than sitting in a sterile box. Well, over the last couple of years, there's been a big movement within uh, interior design to bring natural products, natural fibers, um, you know, green products, things that, um, you know, are, are good for the environment and sustainable. So there's been a, I think, I think the design industry as a whole has been very responsive, responsive to those requests. Um, things like live edge tables where you can see kind of that natural um, exterior of that tree, you know, around the edge. Um, but we're seeing like natural um, shapes, natural um, fibers such as grass cloths and um, texture that have any anything that's really bringing that nature bringing that outside in that organic feel into into the in, indoor area and what I'm on what I'm hearing from my uh, reps uh, my manufacturers reps is that the current circumstances where we've all not been out and, and about as much it's kind of really driving that. So it's really gaining momentum and it's really exciting to see all these beautiful things that are coming in. And I think it's just perfect for us, not, you know, for not only the islands, but Southwest Florida, where we're just so in tuned with all this beauty that's around us and to be able to have that opportunity to bring those, those, you know, that was, um, details into our into our own home. So I think we're all going to see a lot of that. So remember that term biophilic design. That's going to be something that I think is going to be really hot for the next few years. Okay. Um, we do have a question about paint finish. Matt, eggshell, what do you recommend? I tend to like eggshell and I spec that for most of our jobs. Um, reason being that it is washable. Um, they also will sometimes, there's a few, now every manufacturer, Sherwin-Williams, Benjamin Moore, they all have their own names for different things. Um, so they may call it a washable flat, mm. but it is that basically that eggshell finish. Um, really, if you have, have kids in the house, it's, it's, it's hard to touch up a flat and it's hard to keep it clean. If you have kids, if you have guests, if you have renters, um, you know, we just have to kind of think about durability. So I tend to go into that. Um, you know, certainly woodwork, we could take into a semi-gloss, but for for walls, I tend to I tend to spec it into the washable flat, uh, as one manufacturer calls it, or the um, eggshell finish. And what about uh, bathrooms? The same, still the eggshell and washable flat. Yeah, I, you know, sometimes the painters, I don't know, I, they'll they'll suggest a semi on the walls in a bathroom and I just generally don't go into that direction at all. So I find that the eggshell finish is, is, works out very, very nicely within a bathroom environment as well. And is satin the same as eggshell? No, satin is actually, has a slighter, uh, a slight, slighter amount more sheen. Uh, okay. All right. So don't let anyone ever tell you that eggshell is satin. Because I the have heard that. Day. I have heard that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, that's the main thing. Yeah, it's not. Okay. So don't don't accept that. <laughs> Next time I go, I will not accept that. <laughs> yep. Okay. I think I have a satin in my bathroom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I I sometimes um you know if I stop in the paint store, and we'll have those discussions and. You know, and they're always coming out with new names for the finishes. I think the finishes are always the same, but they rebrand them just yeah. to keep things looking fresh. 
but um, no, it, 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 you can tell the difference when you get it on the wall. Okay. Linda, thank you so very much. Oh, for my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. For sharing so much with us today. I really do appreciate it. Um, thank you all for joining us. And if you have questions later on, feel free to reach out to Linda. You can always call me. I don't know as much as Linda does, but I'm here to help. Um, and uh, we look forward to everyone enjoying your weekend. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye-bye.